Okay, uh, so welcome to another event by the IMSA, the Institute of the Mathematical Sciences of the Americas. So the talk today is part of the research semester in topology and gauge theory, and our speaker today is Alexei Kavanov from the University of Cambridge. He will uh, give another lecture tomorrow at the same time, in the same room. And also, I want to remind everyone that next week we have a big conference uh, on gauge theory and low dimensional topology organized by Chris Kaduta and myself. And I hope to see you all there. And uh, now, I say, is to tell us about co associative vibrations. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I think to Mikhail Kacerkov and Mikhail Sigeriev and Mr. Dutta for inviting me. And pleasure to be here again. Um, so, um, so this is going to be a colloquial style, a colloquial style talk. Um, and the main uh, area is actually differential geometry, although I will not immediately start talking differential geometry. And I'll first uh, tell you a little bit about well, what the words in the title means, and in particular, well, here's the plan of the colloquium. I'll start with why dimension 7 is remarkable, and that's a dimension where for social objects are defined. Uh, so specifically, I'll uh, explain cross-product in some dimension space, and then I'll proceed to explain how this can be used to define a particular class of submanifolds, which are called cross-sortative submanifolds. And these are, well, these are submanifolds will be fibers of the cross-sortative vibrations in the title. And so the, uh, the second part of the colloquium uh, will uh, sketch um, missing some important technical details, but I'll give the main ideas in uh, two different constructions of these cross-sortative vibrations, um, the, what I believe to be the interesting features of so that's kind of the general uh, plan. And uh, so I will not immediately start talking geometry. I'll first do, well, apparently this is a triangle, but this is well, not intended as a triangle. It's actually a multiplication table. Uh, more precisely, it's, uh, well, like I said, the first topic of this talk is uh, how to define a product in some dimensional Euclidean space. So we'll make it in the seven-dimensional cross-product algebra. Since it's an algebra, it suffices to know how we multiply the basis vectors. So let's denote the basis vectors by one letters. So in order i, j, k, and then four more, f, uh, e, f, uh, g, h. So the way this multiplication table works is, if you look at this diagram, you'll see uh, there are always Two, uh, any two points, there will be a big line for them, a line or a circle. And also, there are precisely three points for any circle or line. So the way we do the multiplication, uh, we take two basis vectors, uh, we take the unique line which contains them, we know the direction, so all these lines have arrows. If we go with the arrow, then it's the third remaining point with a plus sign, and if we go in the opposite direction, then uh, it's the third remaining point with a minus sign. Since it's a cross product, it's anti commutative. So, for example, i times j, so then we're on a circle inside the triangle, we we'll go from i to j in the positive direction, so the product is plus k. And we we'll multiply another example, we we'll multiply f to j, uh, sorry, f to g, so from f to g, we we'll go against the arrow, so that's k with a minus sign. And so there are exactly about uh, seven, well, seven lines, as we can see it. And uh, so that's, well, now that we know how to multiply basis vectors, we made a product on uh, R7 compatible with the uh, vector space structure, we made it into an algebra. Uh, something else that I can say, there's actually a lot of algebra that one can, what can be said about that. Uh, not all of that is important for this talk, but I could resist the temptation to mention just one fun fact about this triangle. What, what really, this time, well, actually two facts. One is a fun fact, and the other will be important. So the important one is just what I gave you. Uh, we can observe that if we take x, y to be any two of the seven basis vectors, we'll get a standard vector cross-product algebra on the Euclidean space. So the usual 
back and forth. So it can be shown, although it's a non trivial fact, that uh, seven dimensional uh, Euclidean space is the only other dimension uh, where one can define cross products which will largely resemble the vector product in our case. So, um, anyway, that's one important point uh, here. And the fun fact I wanted to say is. So I said it's not really a triangle, so what it is then is that it's uh, a projective plane, uh, sometimes called the final projective plane. Uh, the field of numbers is not real complex numbers, but just a field of two elements, so zero and one. Uh, so then if we just use the usual definition of a projective plane, so all the uh, lines in uh, three-dimensional space, uh, so there will be, uh, since it's a finite field, there are only finitely many points in this projective plane, or exactly seven. And then uh, some triples in a line will contain three points. And so we can see that if uh, any of these Roman letters is replaced by an appropriate uh, three couple of elements in Z2, then uh, we'll get exactly all seven possible lines in a projective plane over the field of two numbers. But of course, we also needed to put orientations on these lines. Um, but this last thing is, like I said, a fun fact. I'm not using it in the talk, but it's sort of curious. Anyway, so now we have a cross product uh, multiplication, a vector product on R7. So, why, uh, well, what, what is remarkable about that? Uh, that allows us to define uh, distinguished subspaces. So like we observe that any uh, triple x, y, x cross y gives us a subalgebra. So any such subalgebra will be called associative uh, two-dimensional subspace. Um, and actually, it turns out that equally interesting, if not more interesting, is to consider orthogonal complements. So that will be four-dimensional subspaces, so that their orthogonal complement is the cross product subalgebra. So these are called co-associatives. Uh, cross associative subspaces, and it will be important for these uh, cross associative submanifolds in this talk. Um, now, uh, a bit more about that. So, since I claim that the cross product on R7 is a bit like a cross product on R3, and what is kind of like a product, we can uh, continue the analogy in three dimensional vector space. We can cover this oriented volume of mixed product. We can resume, uh, repeat this definition and get a uh, Anti-symmetric three-linear form, um, uh, which well, so we take uh, for any three vectors cross product of two, and then we fill in product with a third one. So that will improve the multiplication, um, restore it by all this algebra by just knowing what phi node this. Uh, so, so, so yeah. this should be on R seven. Uh, the phi node is on R seven. Yes. Oh yeah, because this there is R star. Uh, oh, yeah, you're right. That's a misprint. It should be R7 star. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So that's on R7 indeed. Quite a curious line. So, yeah, one can write this phi explicitly in coordinates, and uh, so the order of those Roman letters and write both phi j k, that's 1, 2, 3, and then e uh, f g h with 4, 5, 6, 7. Instead of writing down the three form, I'll write down the four form, uh, the dual. Uh, which is a Hodge group more precisely. So, for example, the view of uh, dx bar, uh, 1, 2, 3 will be dx. So, that's a variation here. So, dx with 4 indices means a uh, wedge of uh, wedge product of dx4, dx5, dx6, dx7. So, the first term is the view of uh, dx1, dx2, dx3. Right? So, okay, yeah, that's a rather straightforward thing. And um, now, uh, here's the first um, slightly deeper result about all of this. Uh, if we use uh, any uh, orthonormal uh, set of four vectors in R7, then uh, if evaluating it on uh, this star of phi naught will always give us either one or something less than one in absolute value. And the quality will occur precisely when these uh, E's are the basis of some or social subspace. So that's a result uh, from a seminal paper of uh, Harvey Wilson and um, Peter Georges. Um, and uh, they also proved equivalent definitions. So instead of uh, asking that the uh, four dimensional subspace is perpendicular to the subalgebra, 
We can just evaluate this phi naught on the subspace, and for all this get zero. Uh, that happens only uh, if and only if the space is also supersectional. So we got a use one useful domain definition. Right, so that so far is a little bit of multilinear algebra, uh, but it already shows that something interesting might be happening in dimension seven. Now we'll start thinking of manifolds. First, I'll pretend that manifolds live in seven dimensional space, although very soon I'll pass to a more general manifold. But uh, for a start, suppose X is a four dimensional sub manifold in R7. Uh, so that Harvey uh, uh, the result uh, guarantees that, uh, so the inequality guarantees that if we uh, induce a metric, uh, on X and we use an invasion, so we can write down the remaining volume form. Uh, so that's a four form on four dimensional manifold, a one dimensional subspace with preferred uh, direction due to orientation. So it makes sense to compare with restriction of star phi naught. And it turns out that it is less or equal. Um, and um, so then, if equality occurs, we'll say it's a consociative four dimensional sub manifold. So that's a uh, basic definition for uh, if it's a manifold of R7. And since we we'll also have a equivalent definition in terms of a free form, so we can instead say that uh, if X is orientable and if phi naught vanishes on X, so that's equivalent to saying that X is cross Okay, um, and now um, some nice properties happen for these cross associative submanifolds. Uh, we can do a little bit of a calculation. Now, here I'm assuming that X is, um, um, right, okay, so I'm saying it's closed or socially fourfold. Uh, and suppose we can see that perturbation. Um, and I'm saying that it must be four homologous, but of course, in, uh, it shouldn't be taken too literally. On R7, topology uh, is trivial. So we can pretend, for example, that it's an open set, uh, R7 with holes. So there could be that non trivial cycles, or alternatively, uh, pretend that we uh, replace R7 with a seven dimensional torus, just take a quotient and get a compact manifold with non trivial topology. So, anyway, suppose there is uh, some perturbation which co homologous in the same uh, homology class, uh, then there is a five dimensional uh, uh, manifold whose boundary, the orientation taken account of, will be an X with. It's positive orientation and X tilde with opposite orientation. So if we then compare the volumes, uh, so volume is integration of the volume form. Uh, we know that on any manifold, the volume form is upper bound of this star phi naught. So uh, for X tilde, uh, the lower bound uh, for the volume will be um, so integration of uh, phi naught. But for X, we assume it's associative, so that's equality. So then we get this inequality. Uh, then we apply Stokes theorem and uh, integrate the differential of uh, star phi naught over n, but we saw explicitly the expression for phi naught is closed. So we get zero. So this basic calculation shows that the cross-associative submanifolds will always have a smallest volume among all those that uh, define the same cycle. And um, so equality occurs precisely when uh, the other semifold is also associated. So they are volume minimizing. Um, in particular, they should be minimal. Uh, now, this doesn't work very well on R7, like I said before, I'm slightly cheated here. But if instead of R7, we start considering more general manifolds with non trivial topology, this display calculation will still make sense. Uh, and we'll get, therefore, this distinguished class of uh, uh, quasi sub manifolds, which will be minimal, and effectively minimized. And I can draw your attention to the fact that um, uh, since uh, we can define the sub manifolds by the vanishing of one form, uh, we're essentially expecting, if we write it explicitly in coordinates, a partial differential equation of first order. Whereas general minimal sub manifolds are defined by partial differential equations of the second order. So that's kind of a simpler and, in some sense, attractive, uh, promising way to obtain uh, classes of minimal sub-manifolds. Okay. 
So that's one motivation. And uh, of course, uh, in all of this, uh, I'm following what's uh, um, known as a theory of calibrations. Uh, that's the way of Arnold Lawson that you can refer to. Um, Okay, so now, like I said, we, we, want, we, we can do it on seven manifolds, seven dimensional manifolds rather than uh, seven dimensional field in space, but then we need something like a three form phi to, to replace the phi number. Uh, so, which form? First of all, something we can observe about phi nodes. So, uh, uh, if we consider the action of three isomorphisms in R7, it induces the action on any associated objects, uh, co vectors. Uh, Tensors, including differential forms. So then the stabilizer of phi naught is a particular group. Um, it's an uh, exceptional D group G2, and it's actually a subgroup of SO7. So anything that stabilizes phi naught will stabilize the hidden product and uh, orientation. So we can use that. Uh, and we have also uh, the four stars, since it's determined by orientation and the uh, the hidden product, the G2 will also stabilize uh, uh, the So we can use that uh, to say precisely what kind of seven manifolds we want to consider. So we want to put a uh, three form on a seven manifold so that at every point this form looks like our one example phi naught. So precisely at any point, consider linear isomorphism between vertical space and R7. Uh, it should be possible to do it in such a way that phi the point will be phi naught in the standard basis of R7. So if we can do that, uh, that's a reduction of a structure group or frame bundle uh, of the seven manifold from a general linear group to uh, a G2 group. So this is a geometry is called the G2 structure. And uh, so then uh, we can also, since uh, the G2 is sub subgroup of uh, so seven, uh, the fourth star will uh, will be well defined, and so we can also have a fourth form on that, which will at every point um, will be a point-wise example of the star of final of the program. So that's a uh, structure of seven manifold, and we can use that uh, to define uh, special submanifolds or social submanifolds. Uh, now, one remark about uh, so, how much of a restriction it is? Uh, do all seven manifolds uh, have such a form? Uh, well, not quite all. Since, uh, well, uh, uh, well uh, every manifold, of course, uh, well, they should be orientable, and for that we'll be able to choose a remaining map. But since G2 is simply connected, we can leave this G2 structure to a spin structure. 2 to 1 power of SO7. So that means that if we have a, such a form phi, the 7 manifold must be spin. It turns out that this necessary condition is also sufficient. So any oriented spin 7 manifold uh, can have such a G2 3 form phi, and in particular, then we can define this class of 7 manifolds. Uh, moreover, and rather more recent result by Crowley Nostrum. Uh, that uh, we can, uh, if a manifold is spin, we can additionally assume that the four form star phi is closed. And uh, recall the closeness of star of phi naught was important uh, to argue that uh, for social sub manifolds are minimal. So if it's a spin manifold, we can choose phi which is for closed, and uh, then uh, the defined class of for social sub manifolds will be minimal. So that's First uh, important point um, of this uh, kind of setting up and introduction. So, in other words, so we uh, well, they will be more than minimal, they will be also more than minimal. Uh, so, here, of course, the knowledge of class is now non trivial since M is allowed to cover any non trivial computation. So, that's uh, one great thing about co associative sub manifolds. Uh, something else is good about them. They have a nice deformation theory. So that was worked out by Robert McLean uh, in the 90s. Uh, in order to have this nice deformation theory, we need to put uh, a different computer condition. This time we're asking for a three form phi to be closed. So let's assume that. And then uh, we'll uh, see so what happens about the deformation. Uh, 
We can use Riemannian exponential map since uh, phi induces a matrix, so we have Riemannian exponential map, and we use normal vector fields along S, uh, along X to define the deformations. Uh, so then, uh, well, the nearby deformations will correspond to this uh, normal sections of a normal bundle. Um, the, the sections are small in the uniform norm. Uh, they will give us small deformations. Uh, now, one nice algebraic fact is uh, if we consider this here, which is a tangent vector to n and an input x, and we consider here a product with phi, we'll get a two form, which will then be always a well defined two form on x on its own manifold. And moreover, it is self dual uh, in the uh, induced matrix. So that means the first star of this two form is the same two form. Um, so, moreover, this map which I wrote from normal vector fields to self dual two forms is a linear isomorphism. So, that means that we can study deformations of all sorts of submanifolds using just the submanifolds themselves, the intrinsic objects, the two forms on the submanifolds, rather than using the exterior manifold. Um, so then, uh, well, what can be further checked, uh, it's not very hard, um, to show that uh, this Xv deformation using normal vector field uh, will be, um, um, well, infinitesimally, uh, it will be given by uh, the self dual two forms which are harmonic, uh, which is equivalent to being closed because, uh, well, by Hodge theory essentially. And then uh, this tells us that this deformation, uh, the number of models, right, the, how many parameters we have in the deformations of all sorts of submanifold is topologically determined. So if we assume that X is compact, then uh, this uh, dimension of cell dual harmonic forms will be the same as the dimension of a maximal uh, positive subspace of the intersection form of this form manifold. So, okay, that's, uh, and in particular, uh, one maybe a remark for experts in deformation theory is that it's known that deformation can be abstracted or unobstructed. Uh, well, uh, abstracted means that uh, if we have an infinitesimal deformation, something which is tangent to a possible deformation, it doesn't mean that the genuine deformation exists, so it may be tangent to something uh, which is not well defined. So this does not happen for all social semicolons. If we found the infinitesimal deformation, it's always tangent to the actual deformation of X. Right. So anyway, the, and the, uh, the deformation space dimension is topologically determined. Uh, now, we may be interested in the situation when this big, uh, this positive part of second vector number is equal to three, because in that case it's four dimensional submanifold inside seven dimensions. If there are three dimensional possibilities of deforming, uh, it may happen that the nearby deformation will give us something like a local variation of the seven manifold. Uh, so in fact, more precisely, if those cell dual two forms which involve the deformations have no zeros. Then indeed, uh, locally, that would be a variation. Uh, so when can that happen? So we then want four dimensional manifolds with positive part of the second vector number equal to three. Two uh, examples that come to mind particularly quickly, either the standard flat four dimensional torus, uh, so its vector number is six, it has a orientation reversal isometry, so B plus is a half of six, which is three, or slightly more, uh, well, example, well, enthusiast of complex algebraic geometry, of course, will know this uh, K3 surface, complex surface of K3 type, which uh, always has a KL metric. Um, so then uh, it will be, uh, yeah, with a KL metric, it will have a correct better number. Uh, so B plus will be equal to 3. Uh, B minus actually will be much larger, 19. And uh, these uh, harmonic forms, um, they will be actually Kähler forms, and so they will not have zeros. So these are three numbers. Okay, so so far I was uh, saying something that was known already for some time. And particularly already to McLean, it was clear that, well, can we actually find these appropriate seven manifolds uh, where these co-associatives exist? And uh, we'll give uh, well, maybe better than local variation. Perhaps they can fiber the entire manifold, uh, possibly with some single fibers. A little bit like the skater surface, which I just mentioned, they have elliptic vibrations where a typical fiber is topologically a torus 
or algebraically elliptic curve, but there are also some single fibers, for which there is a well known nice theory of what kind of singularities, how many single fibers, what is the uh, phase of the formation. So, okay, let's summarize. So, we want uh, this seven manifold, uh, preferably compact, with this form of special algebraic type. We form, uh, it's better be closed and co closed. So, co closed is needed so that fibers are minimal, and closed is needed so magnetic area applies. So, okay, let's uh, well, now try to sketch how this can be possible. Um, what is known, um, well, this is what is known to me um, about the world. Possible examples. So here is one. Uh, initially, uh, I want to be that we try to define compact manifolds, but let's start from something coming from complex geometry, or precisely a complex algebraic geometry. So suppose we've got a Kähler threefold, um, so complex dimension three, real dimension six. Uh, we have done a Kähler form. Let's assume that there is also a non vanishing uh, apolomorphic threefold, so type three zero. Um, and then this algebraic condition, so this theta times uh, theta conjugate, which is a top degree form, uh, then uh, equal to, so that slightly interesting coefficient actually implies that the KL metric is richer than. Let me just write down what's the model example. If that uh, threefold was actually C3, then, uh, okay, the KL form, of course, will be just a standard syntactic form. So that's dz1 times dz1 bar. Uh, I think one needs to divide it by 2, multiply by i. And similarly, dz2 plus as wedge dz2 bar plus dz3 wedge dz3 bar. Right? And theta will correspond to just well, the usual volume form, but written in holomorphic coordinates. So dz1, which dz2, which dz3. So you can check on this example, uh, you'll get, if you multiply theta times theta conjugate, compare with omega cube, uh, that will be this coefficient. Now, C3 has, of course, a flat here. I think, in general, if we've got a complex threefold with this relation, it implies that the KL matrix will be rich flat. So it's uh, sometimes called the Calabi-Yau space, the Ricci flat table. Okay, so suppose we've got one of those. Uh, compact or not, for the moment, it's not important. Um, so then it turns out we can pick a product with a circle, or with a integral, or with anything one-dimensional, and write down the forms which will be of the phi type. So here are the explicit expressions. So phi will be KL form times ds, where s is for the circle. And this uh, dual is half KL form with itself, minus a uh, real part of uh, the Newton volume form times the S. And of course, since KL form is closed, uh, we can check that phi is closed. Uh, also, this, um, sorry, the uh, homomorphic volume form, it's also a closed form. So phi and star phi are both closed, so that's a good example. Um, so now, what about the cosociatives? If we can see the complex surface in W. So that means it's a surface, so theta vanishes by dimensions. Um, and also ds will vanish because we fix s, so we just can see the surface in W. So we see every complex surface uh, x in W will give us the uh, same surface times at some point in the circle. Uh, that will be a cosocial fourfold. That's, of course, not too surprising because. In the example of complex surfaces, what I told you about for social fourfold will give us a very similar but rather better known theory. The inequality about the four social spaces will be the famous Wittgenberg inequality in complex geometry, and the volume minimizing property will correspond to the fact that KL, uh, in a KL manifold, the complex uh, surfaces are volume minimizing in their homology class. We have a reference equals of Wittgenberg property. But here we are in all dimensions, so there's a way to do something similar in dimension 7. Unfortunately, only in dimension 7, it doesn't generalize to other all dimensions. It's uh, uh, unique to this dimension. Okay, so now, uh, so what I'm going to do, Let, let's uh, have a concrete example of appropriate W. Let's do some algebraic geometry. Start from an intersection of three projects. 
so in uh, complex projective space of dimension six, so that's a threefold. If we choose the quadrix generically, that's a non-simple algebraic variety, it's a manifold. Uh, we consider a generic hyperplane plane section, so that's the intersection of three quadrics in CP5 now. That's a famous example of a key three surface. Uh, if we choose another hyperplane uh, section, we'll get intersection of two K3 surfaces in V. Uh, that will be a complex curve, a compact human surface. Uh, one can compute, uh, for example, degrees uh, and uh, topology. Um, but anyway, for a start, uh, we consider the family of hyperplane sections which are all passing through this curve, the C. So if we think of any hyperplane section as a linear form, that's lambda times first linear form plus mu times second linear form. So that's a CP1 family. Since we're interested in zeros, so lambda and mu uh, can be simultaneously multiplied by a complex constant, and they should go to zeros. So that gives us a, a, a homomorphic map. Uh, so, um, but it will not be well defined on B, since on C it will be out many uh, hyperplane sections passing through it. So we blow up C, and then all those uh, intersecting K3 surfaces will become distinct. And we'll get a K3 vibration of this blow up W bar, uh, or analytically it's just an aeromorphic function. So it's an aeromorphic map of CP1. Right, but this doesn't satisfy all the uh, requirements uh, because we don't yet have a holomorphic point form. We have some algebraic variety, it's a K manifold. So it turns out that uh, the anti canonical bundle of three zero forms. Um, uh, well, they, it will have a form which vanishes exactly on the hyperplane section K3 surface and non zero hyperbarics. So, if we remove uh, K3 from uh, this, uh, from V or from its blow up, then we'll get a manifold whose anticanonical bundle of three zero forms is, uh, has a holomorphic trivialization. So, that's uh, okay. So, let's denote this result of W with our bar. So, we remove a phi mod tau. And that now has a non-vanishing holomorphic free form, and moreover, one can find a compatible Richard flat here metric. So that's a rather non-trivial result. It comes from a um, uh, generalization of Yao's solution of the Kalabi conjecture, which was initiated by Tan and Yao uh, for many classes of positive projective uh, complex manifolds. Um, then in uh, this particular version that is needed for the example I'm talking about. So it was further worked by myself, and then later the ultimate theory was approved by Hastings and Nostrum. So we can find this appropriate, let's just go to the previous slide, recall what we wanted. So we wanted this theta uh, omega. So we can have that if we start from the intersection of three quadrics, blow up this uh, uh, curve, uh, which is, comes from this CP1 family, and then remove one of the fibers. Okay. And so we'll get this um, ratio flat here of space, and we still have this homomorphic vibration. Uh, we can now take a product with a circle, we get some manifold, and then we'll get this minimal co-associative K3 surfaces. But our space is not compact yet. Uh, so we haven't yet done something too ambitious, we just exploited some algebraic geometry and then a bit of a colonial theory. Inspired by but there is more. So, uh, first of all, uh, we can improve this vibration. Uh, it will be important what kind of single fibers we have. Uh, in the example, uh, can, it probably can be checked directly, but one can do it more generally. But anyway, one can choose these patients, these two hyperplanes, H and H prime, in such a way that this tau uh, is what is called a Lefschetz function. So, Lefschetz function is like a Morse function, but in a holomorphic space. Uh, sorry, in a homomorphic sense. It means that all these critical points will have a non-degenerate Hessian. And then uh, there is a homomorphic Morse lemma which guarantees that locally around the critical point, tau will look like, so let me write down this uh, explicit form, will be like z1 square plus z2 square plus z3 square. Yeah, so, um, right, so tau can be made in the homomorphic map. All of whose similarities are of this type, the appropriate choice of local coordinates. And then uh, by Lefschetz theory, which is this uh, 
actually I was told it was uh, lapses developed even before mostly appeared. But anyway, one can topologically determine exactly how many of these singular fibers uh, we got, so singular values of tau. It's uh, this expression I wrote twice the other characteristic of, um, of x, so the x is a particular surface in our case, uh, minus the other characteristic of this uh, perfect curve, minus the other characteristic of the so that's uh, basically a calculation. So K3 surface has only characteristic 24. Uh, the only characteristic of C is actually degree of V. It has to do with the fact that V is a algebraic uh, variety of degree 8. Uh, so that will be then uh, well, with the opposite side. So then plus 8. And then uh, all the characteristic of V itself, again, that's a way to find out better numbers of uh, algebraic varieties, at least in this example. Uh, for example, computing the full Chern class. So, well, calculation gives us 18. So that's just one particular example. So that's uh, how many single fibers tau has on W. And of course, if you take a product with a circle, that will be 18 circles consisting of single K3 surfaces, each with an ordinary number point, uh, exactly one ordinary number point similarity. Okay, so that. Uh, one uh, feature, but don't get said uh, how to make things compact. So, well, turns out we'll need to take a pair of such examples. Uh, uh, the nice thing about them is that Richard Metcalf and I mentioned uh, can be uh, chosen to be asymptotically symmetrical. Uh, so, our non compact manifold is non compact in a rather basic way. It has like uh, compact piece and then something which is important to a product cylinder goes or half cylinder going to infinity. Uh, right? And because uh, we get a vibration, so the removed fiber has a trivial normal bundle, in fact, holomorphic material, that gives us a topology of that cylindrical N. So it's a K3 surface times a half line times two circles. So next, maybe better first look at the picture. So we want basically to join these two objects and get a compact manifold. So one how well, part of the story is mm, uh, probably rather uh, intuitive. Uh, we have something asymptotically cylindrical, so let's slightly perturb it so it becomes exactly cylindrical somewhere far away down the cylindrical end to minimize the error terms uh, from, from our method. Then we truncate the ends, get compact manifold with boundary, and then we identify two small colored neighborhoods of the two boundaries, well, as in this picture, and we'll get a compact manifold. Uh, but we don't want to get just another well, connected sum of two algebraic from three folds times a circle, because then we may end up doing just the complex three dimensional geometry. So there is a kind of non trivial way, which I don't go into details, but uh, one can kind of swap the two circles. So uh, let's recall the geometry. One circle is this x s one factor. The other circle is a circle which is going around the scalar fiber that we removed. Uh, and uh, that W itself is simply connected, so the circle around the scalar fiber can be contracted to a point. So if we identify a circle about the fiber in one space with an extra circle in another space, um, and vice versa, then any candidates for non trivial to another form uh, will disappear, uh, will be contractible to a point, and we'll get a compact, simply connected seven manifold. Moreover, with a little bit more calculation on the topology side, one can check that this manifold is actually two connected. So its second homotopy group is also trivial. Um, the third uh, group was actually not trivial. So homology is uh, rather large, but I will try to go on here. So anyway, uh, so that's uh, sometimes uh, now these days came to be called the twisted connected sum construction. Uh, initially wrote down it, including this example in 2003. Uh, one particular feature is that this uh, joining the two ends can be done in such a way that we almost we take minimal damage to this uh, form phi. Actually, it will be slightly perturbed. Um, one will need to do a bit of a determinative analysis to show that uh, the resulting compact seven manifold still has a closed or closed T form. 
Um, anyway, that's, uh, let me show you on the next slide what's going to happen. So this uh, W1, W2, T means that it's a truncated version of that uh, natural decimal length, so it's now compact with um, uh, boundary. Uh, therefore, it projects a, a vibration that maps it not to the whole of the complex plane. Uh, actually, well, the complex plane initially was a component of a point in CD1, but then since we truncated, we get something like a disk in a complex plane. So that's delta time S1. Union delta times another S1. So on the top row, we'll get our seven manifold, which is sketched before. On the bottom row, we'll get S3. This is actually easy to show rigorously because uh, let's think of our uh, S1 as a, a boundary of a disk, and then we'll get the boundary of uh, delta times delta which is topologically a four-dimensional ball, so that's a three sphere. But on the other hand, it's a boundary of the first factor times the second factor, union of first factor times the boundary of the second factor, which is what you can see on the bottom row of the diagram. So that's the topology side of thing. Um, it's kind of weak to explain. Uh, what I'm hiding here is there is a rather non-trivial and long technical perturbative analysis to show that the tree form survives this uh, perturbation pattern pasting. And secondly, which is extra analysis work to show what happens to the fibers of that holomorphic map. Um, so we're, we're no longer doing holomorphic geometry since here we're in the fourth dimension. So one has to do a, a, just a regular analysis of uh, linear operators. Uh, so various results, um, so the in their type, uh, the more local component analysis on manifolds with cylindrical lens, and some other elliptical thermal theory. So I'm kind of suppressing all that and just invite you to believe that it can be done. Uh, so anyway, what do we get then? What kind of vibration? So we see at least topologically, generic fiber of tau is a K-tree surface. We get 80 circles from uh, tau 1 and another 80 from tau 2. Uh, the way we join these two solid tori in the A3 means that every circle in the first group of 80 will be linked to the linking number 1 with every circle in the other group, in the second group. And above any point in the circle, there will be our single K3 with a unique ordinary double point. Right? And well, uh, to remind, all those fibers of tau are actually volume minimizing at minimum. Uh, so we have this nice complete description with the smooth and single fibers. Moreover, the smooth fibers, we can see they are maximal because well, uh, this uh, complement uh, uh, is three, co-dimension three, and B plus for KT surface is also is three. Uh, one can further check uh, by considering these single KT surfaces that McLean type deformation theory extends to them and the number of moduli will be one. So that means that single fibers in this tower are also forming a maximum deformation factor. So yeah, that's the example of K3 vibration. And uh, well, so it's already said and summarized. Uh, I concentrated on one particular algebraic variety, but in reality, uh, it's just an instance of something more general. Instead of three quartics in CP6, we can consider an arbitrary uh, threefold called the final threefold, uh, non single final threefold. They're all classified. There are, if I remember correctly, 105 deformation families. Um, uh, and uh, so uh, one can take any, well, almost any pair. And there may be one or two exceptions where uh, I'm not sure. But anyway, most of the pairs uh, can be joined uh, to form the pair. Moreover, uh, later, um, uh, Haskins, Heim, uh, uh, sorry, Haskins, uh, Pacini, and Nostrum, and Corsi showed that uh, one can generalize instead of on the three holes, have a weaker version of them and extend all this theory um, uh, that one can at least define the M. And I think, at least in some examples, the vibration construction will also work. But it's certainly, I mean, I. In confidence about the classical form of the 
So that's the example uh, with a key thing. Uh, now, there was, what about this apparently simpler manifold, the four dimensional torus? Turns out a bit paradoxically that that apparently simpler manifold doesn't work so well. Kind of, it's much harder to get the vibration by torus. Uh, but anyway, let me tell you kind of a bit of a partial result, partial example of what at least can be done. So first I'll need to sketch uh, how to make a proper seven manifold. Uh, actually, the construction of this seven manifold is uh, uh, quite explicit and not very hard. It's, uh, yeah, I wrote some of the calculation, not all, um, but well, one of the it's, um, it's basically all in the uh, paper, which I'll mention in a moment. Uh, so we start from a family of six dimensional real tori. Uh, so a portion of R6 by a lattice, the lattice will depend on X and will uh, vary periodically with X. Uh, actually, not quite periodically, but I uh, will just do this map in torus with glue, uh, T naught with T2 to make something, well, not quite a seven torus, but a map in torus. It will be a compact, closed seven manifold. Uh, now one can basically compare the lattice for X equals zero and X equals two and see that the following uh, six-dimensional automorphism uh, will give a well-defined uh, identification, so the mapping torus will be uh, uh, well-formed. Uh, now, uh, one needs to do a little bit more of it. Uh, again, an explicit check shows that this involution rule uh, acts, uh, gives a well-defined map of this M, uh, so we get M hat, but that's not a manifold, that's an orbifold, it has portion singularities. Uh, precisely, it's a disjoint union of 16 uh, dimensional tori inside this seven manifold. Singularities locally look like three torus times a uh, quotient uh, of complex plane by plus minus one. So then, uh, well, there is a classical way to try to resolve these singularities that blow up. So one can do that. Uh, moreover, one can uh, do it compatibly with Riemannian matrix. Uh, so on C two, we um, have a standard Euclidean matrix. Uh, if, when we do this uh, resolution uh, in the real dimensional four, the resolution actually is in some sense equivalent to a deformation. Uh, so, but anyway, the matrix on the resolved manifold is the famous Ekinchi Hansen hyperplane matrix. Um, so it's in particular Ricci flat. So one can use that Gucci uh, Hansen theory in order to make put a compatible metric uh, locally around the uh, singular points of this orbifold to form a um, smooth manifold. Uh, right, and well, again, something I'm not quite writing down because again, uh, this G two three form can be written down explicitly in coordinates up to the orbifold, and then one can show that one can patch it with the Gucci Hansen and get this uh, form and result manifold, which will still have a G2 type, uh, which will be closed, but it will not be co-closed. So anyway, let, uh, if we believe that, then we get uh, this description of a uh, seven manifold. Something I didn't put in the slides, but I can just mention, uh, just in case uh, the people who uh, know this theory, there is alternative way to describe the same manifold M from which you take the orbital in the resolution. One starts with the nilpotent P group of seven dimensions. So topologically, the group is just a seven, but the product is uh, uh, different. And then uh, one can see the discrete subgroup, and then M will be a space of cosets of that subgroup. So that's another way to describe the same man. So in particular, using that description, it's a bit easier to see why rho is a well-defined involution. Um, and also this uh, well, can help to calculate the topology of this result manifold. But anyway, that's a quick sketch. Uh, but it's uh, up to the smoothing, it's quite explicit and written on full coordinates. It's just a long expression. So, uh, anyway, I'll jump to one of the results uh, that is proved. It's a joint work with the uh, co authors uh, Marisa Fernandez, uh, Anna Fina, and Vicente Munoz. Uh, we studied different questions about this uh, M tilde, but among other things, we were able to show that this M tilde does have a vibration, a typical fiber for social torus. 
um, um, there are also single fibers. Uh, singularity looks like uh, basically it's a crossing, and the variable crosses itself with two dimensional intersection. Uh, but it turns out that it's an inversion um, of torus times a two uh, sphere. So the self intersection corresponds to a point in the two sphere. Um, uh, so the single fibers occur in one parameter families. Uh, uh, the smooth fibers and uh, single fibers are each a uh, maximal family. This example of maximality is easier to see. So for four torus, we already know P plus equals P. For, so remember, the deformation period depends on intrinsic parameters. We just need to know the actual manifold. So we need P plus of this manifold, and it's easier to check that it's one. It's topologically rather simple object. So this one parameter family of single fibers are also uh, uh, maximum. So that's a uh, quick description of this example. Now, this is uh, not quite a perfect result, which I would personally want, because uh, the only the deformation peer works well here. Uh, the form and key form is closed, but the full form is not closed. So these fibers there have this algebraic significance, but they are not minimal manifolds. Uh, moreover, it's impossible to improve this example because this term tilde uh, doesn't meet a form of chief type which is simultaneously closed and co-closed. So one can have either one or another. Uh, uh, but there are other manifolds which do admit uh, those closed forms. Uh, they are constructed differently, but they kind of technical, well, that's probably a little bit easier to show if I just jump so, over. What kind of uh, like uh, yeah. if you have this closed and closed, uh, what is what kind of restriction is it on, on the manifold? Ah, well, the short answer is it's very non trivial and hard to get examples. Okay. There are by now, I think, essentially three different methods of producing examples. So, the earliest, uh, these are so called torsion free G2 manifolds. They are rigid flat seven manifolds of special volumetry. Compact examples were initially done by the first construction was due to Donny and Joyce in the, uh, in the middle of the 90s. Uh, so that was done by uh, taking caution to the seven torus and then resolving similarities. A little bit like a Kuma construction of KT surface. Uh, then there is this connected sub which I showed here, which I did uh, when the paper was published in 2003, and this is its nickname twisted connected sum. And there is one more construction uh, due to Joyce and Caridianis, uh, which, uh, uh, which is kind of quite it's fairly recent, uh, a few years ago. Um, it's basically uh, what instead of a seven torus, one uses a Calabiao threefold times a circle. And, um, so that um, I think that's uh, currently everything. There are some ideas which may lead to further construction, but it's a very ambitious task. And not all of those uh, spaces necessarily have chaotic vibrations. I only claim it for the connected sum ones, and not for all of them. Uh, if, if they're done from final three folds, then things are good. But uh, there are other complex three folds which allow to have these torsion free to manifolds, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure that it's possible to get this holomorphic Morse function or Lepschitz functionals of these building blocks. Or uh, well, at least if it's possible, I have no idea how to find it. So it's, there's a lot of, uh, like I said, I showed you the tip of the iceberg, but there's a lot of various technical works and great ideas and even better questions. Not all of them I probably fear even for the experts. Uh, but anyway, I actually wanted to uh, say a little bit about the uh, details of this vibration. So I stated the theorem, but to give it a bit more reality, uh, let me just show a little bit uh, how this vibration works. So, uh, so we can, first of all, uh, we can uh, start with the manifold M. Um, and, uh, then, uh, since it's a mapping torus, we've got immediately a map in the R over 2z, that's this x coordinate, and then we can use x2 and x3. Uh, turns out these cosets uh, x1, x2 plus z, x3 plus z will be well defined. 
So that will give us a well-defined method that reports. Uh, then uh, we check by direct evaluation that the map is compatible with this evolution goal, and therefore M hat, the order form, still has a map, and uh, it turns out there will be this uh, of the motorus, this famous topological object, sometimes nicknamed the pillowcase, topologically a sphere. Um, so it turns out that one can then uh, induce from the all default vibration a vibration of resolved smooth manifold. Um, so horizontal areas here are the resolution maps. Uh, this Q hat comes from direct portion of this Q, and Q tilde is uh, adapted to have a little bit of perturbation. But here the analysis, well, it's not really much of analysis, it's just a Kind of careful use of couple functions. So, well, that's you know, a little bit of um, details of how uh, the vibration theorem was obtained. Um, I, think that I probably show just one more slide. Um, uh, one of the, well, some remarks on this last result, and then uh, kind of more confession, but a rather ambitious one. So, this M tilde, like I said, doesn't have a closed or closed form. So we choose the closed one because it allows nice information theory, but we sacrifice the minimality of the bias. Uh, now, uh, if instead one uses a manifold from Joyce's construction, well, that's something that was already attempted. So Goldstein published in 2002 paper uh, where he came pretty close to the theorem like the one I stated here, but he wasn't able to improve that vibration. It's not just a proper uh, problem in perturbative analysis, it's also a, a problem of uh, what kind of similar fibers we have. But if uh, a small perturbation destroys their topological structure, then the analysis problem wouldn't be well posed because we changed the manifold in which we work. So, uh, well, that's currently. Unfortunately, no examples. And I still believe that some of Joyce's examples can be equipped with a vibration similar to that theorem that I stated. But uh, if that's true, probably we would take still non trivial effort and almost certainly one or two good new ideas. Okay, so I think that's probably uh, a better thing that I wanted to say today. So.